B4044 strategic cycle link between Botley and Ensham. This project would significantly boost sustainable travel between the new housing planned around Ensham to Oxford city centre, linking through more deprived communities. Does the minister agree that this is exactly the kind of active travel initiative that we need more of in areas of high housing and economic growth, especially given our desire to achieve zero carbon Oxfordshire by 2050? I haven't seen her a particular application yet, but we do know that there are over three billion uh, pounds, uh, sorry, two billion pounds of uh, active travel funding for walking and cycling, uh, which this government has put in a record amount. And I know the honourable lady will be delighted uh, that uh, Oxfordshire investment has now reached three hundred and fifty-five million pounds in different transport uh, environments, and that's on top of the seven hundred and sixty million pounds for East West Rail. So when it comes to investing. Uh, in her constituency in Oxfordshire, this Conservative government is really going for it. We now go to the chair of the select committee. You, Merriman, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I wonder if the Secretary of State is hearing, as I am, uh, that our airports and border force are getting people through arrivals more quickly and therefore more safely. Is he confident that uh, we will be in a position to get more people who've perhaps been double jabbed through arrivals, that we have digitisation and the NHS app will seek to deliver proof of double jab. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right. The last few weeks have seen a remarkable digital transformation in the background. That means that uh, people who have been coming in, perhaps from green countries, have been going to e-gates, which have been updated both physically and through software, or indeed to see a border force officer uh, who have had their passport scanned in one way or the other. And that's been automatically linked back to the passenger locator form that they filled out before they left their country of departure, telling Border Force whether they've uh, had a pre-departure test, they've got future tests uh, booked, uh, and linking the whole machinery together. So yes, the automation is really starting to get into place now. So the Secretary of State, Jim McMahon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, hundreds of workers in the aviation and tourism industry held a demonstration outside Parliament urging the government to protect their jobs and the jobs of 1.5 million people uh, employed in aviation and the wider supply chain. So, on behalf of the countless staff and trade unions I spoke to, will he finally deliver on the sectoral deal his government promised but has so far has failed to deliver? And when he makes his announcement later on on the traffic light system, which should uh, be noted, Mr Speaker, isn't being made to this House, will he publish the criteria, the country-by-country country assessment and the direction of travel for each country to give travellers confidence to plan for this summer. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I find um, the, the Honourable Gentleman's policy confusing only because, as I understand it, he has previously called for all countries to be put into the red category, meaning there be no uh, travel at all, and, in addition, the former, I have to say, Shadow Chancellor, saying that Labour would never provide financial support to these companies. Uh, and yet, here they are now, uh, saying that they want more support and, indeed, doesn't want to follow his own policy. Uh, I have to say uh, that having a red, amber and green list uh, enables people to see uh, which countries are in which category, and that the JBC are publishing the data on the website to show why particular countries are in each category. Mr Speaker, I can give you an assurance that I have tried my hardest to get the Transport Secretary to fully understand our sectoral deal and the way that we've laid it out. But, Mr Speaker, I can't help the confusion that continues to reign uh, with his Transport Secretary. Let's now move closer to home. Uh, we've had two questions today on the DVLA in Swansea, and the Transport Secretary did not give a convincing answer to either. It was reported last week that a deal had been reached uh, with staff and trade unions and the government to finally resolve the industrial dispute over health and safety failings at the DVLA in Swansea. But it was reported that the deal was pulled last minute by a minister. So can the Secretary of State confirm whether he or senior members of the department pulled the deal, and if so, why? The Secretary of State and his department are now squarely against the loyal workforce at DVLA Swansea. What will he now do to restore trust and confidence in those fantastic workers? Mr Speaker, the Public and Commercial Services Union continue to take industrial action, which is targeting services having a negative impact on some of the most vulnerable people in society. 
And the fact of the matter is, the safety concerns have been signed off by Public Health Wales, by the Health and Safety Executive, by the Welsh Government, by the uh, UK Government, and yet this strike continues. Now, apparently not about healthcare, but about demands over money instead. Will the honourable gentleman, I wonder, actually ask people to go back to their work in order to help vulnerable people in this country? That is the question this House needs to know. Next question, Andrew Griffith. Andrew, not here. Let us go to SNP spokesperson Gavin Newton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I've lost count of the number of times that I've asked this government about its long abandoned commitment to specific support for the aviation sector. And despite the Secretary of State's um, tinkering with the traffic light system, it looks increasingly unlikely there will be any summer uh, season. It's clear to the dogs on the street that an aviation travel and tourism recovery package and a targeted extension of follow is now an imperative. So, how does the Secretary of State plan to better support the sector and its workers like those? has been mentioned that we were at the Travel Day of Action protests in College Green yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the Department uh, does recognise the severe impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on regional air travel. Uh, we supported critical routes through policies such as public service obligations and through the airport and ground operations support scheme. The Government is working on a strategic framework for the sector, which will focus on building back better and ensuring successful aviation sector for the future. But what the aviation sector will certainly be glad of is, is that, that it is this government that is looking after their interests, not the Scottish government, which has been accused of uh, sacrificing the industry by the Scottish Passenger Agents Association. Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I welcome the new flexible season ticket that was introduced uh, this week? It will save someone travelling from Stamford La Hope into London three days a week over £120, and someone travelling from Basildon over £100. Does my right honourable friend agree? As more and more people uh, move to hybrid working, it's important we have flexibility in our public transport systems. Well, Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and uh, I saw some coverage of, of the flexible season tickets. And it is true to say that ticketing is complex across the network. But compared with somebody who would otherwise buy a regular season ticket, uh, somebody travelling two or three days a week would always be at least 20% better off with a flexible season ticket. Let's go to Janet Davey. Janet. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A constituent of mine uh, who was blind tragically died last year when he fell in front of a train due to lack of safety audio announcement and tactile uh, paving on the platform. I know the government has plans for tactile paving, although unclear at the moment, but while we are waiting for this to happen, will the minister commit to introducing audio announcement, announcements which provide safety information at railway stations as a matter of urgency to keep people safe and to prevent another person from losing their life? I'm, honourable to the, uh, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. It was an absolute tragic um, case that I'm familiar with. Indeed, I know that my uh, Honourable Friend, the, the Rail Minister, uh, met with the partner of the deceased last week and discussed uh, all of these matters, including uh, the integration of audible uh, announcements, which we consider uh, to be very important indeed. Uh, and we are uh, speeding up the introduction of tactile uh, uh, pavements uh, close to, uh, well, within railway stations and, in particular, close to the rail tracks. Let's go to Nick Aiken. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Improving our air quality is a major priority for my constituents, and both they and I remain very concerned about the ongoing number of drivers who continue to idle their vehicles when parked at the curbside. A single minute of idling uh, an engine of a car creates nine litres of CO2. Unfortunately, Regulation 98 of the Road Vehicles Regulation 1986 does not adequately equip local authorities with the power they need to deter repeat engine idlers, only an £80 fine. With this in mind, does my right honourable friend agree with me that we should really now be considering increasing fines for vehicle drivers who are continuing to engine idle? making it a genuine, effective deterrent. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know my honourable friend is a passionate campaigner on this issue, and I completely agree that it's vital that we take action. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, it will be better technology, such as stop, start, and zero emission vehicles, which will solve this issue. Uh, the UK is a global leader in the development and the manufacture of electric vehicles, and we will continue to work to foster that position. Let's go to Jeff Smith. Jeff. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, experts have warned that the carbon impact of the government's £27 billion road building programme could be around 100 times greater than the official government estimates. So why won't the government reassure us by committing to a comprehensive environmental impact assessment of the plans? Well, Mr Speaker, I think in the same session we've managed to hear the Honourable Gentleman be firstly anti-air, now he's anti-road. Uh, as I've just explained to the House, uh, there is a way in which we can ensure that this country stays well connected and we serve the people uh, that we represent and that we ensure that we, have, we foster technology, because it's technology that is going to give us the answer to the zero carbon emissions challenge that we have. Let me withdraw and shall we go to Cat Smith? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, ending financial support before uh, demand is returned could leave bus and light rail operators facing a cliff edge. So can I ask what plans the government has to ensure a smooth recovery for operators uh, like Blackpool Transport yeah. uh, to expand their timetables and on routes like the 2C which runs through to Not End on Sea via many other villages? Well, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right that bus transports require a huge amount of support. We've put hundreds of millions in during this uh, pandemic. Uh, we've obviously also launched the Bus Back Better uh, bus strategy as well, which puts a lot of money uh, into buses, some £3 billion. In the meantime, I will in, uh, ensure that we return to this House to talk about further uh, ways in which we can support our uh, bus sector and ensure that those essential local links that she describes are maintained. Go to Craig Whitaker. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Calder Valley Line is a major strategic passenger and freight line that was placed as the top priority in the 2015 Northern Sparks report, which highlights that the Calder Valley Line is long overdue in playing its part in decarbonising the transport ne network. Can my right honourable friend update the House on when we can expect the publication of the government's transport decarbonisation plan? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, yes, the, the transport decarbonisation plan is very central to uh, our lead into COP26, and it's absolutely essential uh, that we get this right, and indeed that it's ambitious uh, enough to match the uh, scale of the problem that we face. Uh, so my honourable friend won't need to uh, wait long, and I think he'll be impressed by the ambition. Try again. Adam, can I jump in? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was recently contacted by the McKenna family in my constituency in regards to the availability of driving tests. Ross had to travel to Blackpool in order to sit his theory test, and he's unable to sit his practical test in a timely manner because there's a backlog of tests. This is an issue that's impacting many of my constituents. So, will the department speak to the relevant agencies and look at giving additional funding in order to create more localised testing? Well, Mr Speaker, first of all, can I um, welcome the Honourable Lady to the House? And I think what is certainly the first question to, uh, in transport questions. Uh, and secondly, can I uh, say to her, uh, in my own household, I have two teenagers who uh, quite literally ask me the same questions every day of the week. Uh, there is a very large backlog, about 440,000, uh, due to the uh, pandemic. Uh, there's a recovery plan that uh, the agency uh, have in place to increase the number of tests uh, carried out uh, every day, uh, and uh, I will personally be seeing uh, to them keeping two track on that recovery plan because, as she says, young people need to be able to take their tests and pass. Let's go to Mary Robinson. Mary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Lorry drivers like my constituent Stuart have kept this country going through the pandemic, but they face a threat of robbery and assault on a regular basis. He tells me there aren't enough facilities where drivers can take their legally required breaks, forcing many to park in laybys, and that even the facilities that exist can be inadequate and insecure. Could I ask the Minister to look at this issue and work with the industry to increase the number of secure truck stops for these drivers who are a critical part of our economy? 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I join my honourable friend in paying tribute to the hauliers like Stuart, who have quite literally kept this country moving uh, over the course of the last 18 months. My department will continue work started last year to engage with stakeholders, including the freight associations, to encourage the development of more safe, secure and high-quality lorry parking. Nick Smith. Not here. Right, let us see if Sarah Brithliff's online. Sarah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Improving our railway stations and improving connectivity across East Lancashire is key to levelling up and making sure we spread opportunity, but we still have accessibility issues at some of our train stations, such as Oswald Whistle. Can the Secretary of State outline whether there will be further support to improve this across areas, such as mine in Hindburn and Haslinden? Well, Mr Speaker, all of the funding currently available to Access for All has been allocated to projects, including nearby Accrington Station, with works due to be completed by 2024 at the latest. When further funding is available, any station without an accessible route into the station and to all platforms will be a potential candidate. Right, let's go for the final question from Sir Greg Knight. Sir Greg. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Ministers are aware that E10 fuel, due to be introduced from September this year, is not compatible with all motor vehicles, and that older vehicles in particular can suffer serious damage if they use it. What extra measures are the government intending to take, therefore, to ensure that motorists are fully aware of these dangers so they do not, in error, fill their vehicles with the wrong fuel? And can a minister also assure me that the information on the Government UK website on whether a vehicle can run on E10 fuel or not is completely up to date, comprehensive and correct. Well, Mr Speaker, I can uh, reassure uh, 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 that uh, that website is indeed already uh, up to date and will be accurate. Uh, it is the case that some older vehicles and historic vehicles, the kind of cars that I know uh, he is very uh, keen on, uh, which don't take uh, E10, it will be very clearly marked and he'll be pleased to hear that E5 will continue to be available uh, so that historic cars can continue on our roads. I'm now suspending the House for three minutes to enable necessary arrangements to be made for the next business. Order.
We now come to business questions. I call Thangham Debenham. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, uh, will the Leader of the House please give us the forthcoming business? The business for the week commencing the 28th of June will include Monday, the 28th of June, the second reading of the rating coronavirus and directors' disqualification dissolved companies bill, followed by a motion relating to the appointment of lay members to the Committee of Standards, followed by a motion relating to the membership of the Parliamentary Works Sponsor Body. <coughs> Tuesday, the 29th of June, Estimates Day, first allotted day. There will be debates on estimates relating to the Department for Education and on the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Wednesday, the 30th of June, Estimates Day, second allotted day. There will be a debate on an estimate relating to the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office. At 7 o'clock, the House will be asked to agree all outstanding estimates. Thursday, the 1st of July, proceedings on the Supply and Appropriation Main Estimates Bill, followed by a general debate on Windrush Day, followed by a general debate on Pride Month. The subjects for these debates were recommended by the Backbench Business Committee. Friday, the 2nd of July, the House will not be sitting. The provisional business for the week commencing the 5th of July will include Monday, the 5th of July, remaining stages of the Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill. Tuesday, the 6th of July, Second reading of the dissolution and calling of Parliament Bill. Wednesday, the 7th of July, an opposition day, the fourth allotted day. There will be a debate on a motion in the name of the Scottish National Party, the subjects to be announced. Thursday, the 8th of July, a general debate on fuel poverty, followed by a debate on a motion relating to the implementation of the recommendations of the Independent Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review. The subject for this debate was determined by the Backbench Business Committee. Friday the 9th of July, the House will not be sitting. <laughs>